is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey, this is a forward, uh, an intro for season six, episode two of the Chris Abraham show. This is Chris Abraham. All the trigger warnings, all the trigger warnings, please trigger, 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 warning, 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 warning. You have been warned. Proceed at your own risk. Hey there, this is season six, episode two of the Chris Abraham show. My name is Chris Abraham, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about what I believe, being Chris Abraham, or on Mastodon, Chris the Schlepper, as I walk now with my backpack and my shoes and my fringe TV show baseball cap, my my fit check. I have a pair of uh, Nike Pegasus Trail 4s and a GR2. 26 liter coyote brown backpack and a blue blue with gray molly straps blue with gray molly and gray straps help people gear is it a called a recon vest i don't know anyway consensus reality i believe a that we live in a computer sim however that computer looks and that there's patches and upgrades and glitches and b that it is a consensus reality, and see uh, whatever you want to call it, whether it's prayer or magic or intention or uh, media or literature or culture or culture hacking or oratory or education or secondary education or news programs or salacious page six content, or TikTok, or Twitter, or x.com, or whatever, we are the result of an emergent existence of what is true and untrue. And up till now, in America, it's been relatively nuanced, at least from 1970 when I was born until now. But over the past, past few years, I believe that whoever has enough power to get to define what the United States is when it sees itself in the mirror, um, those people, whomever they are, um, the establishment, the deep state, the the uh, forever government, the powers that be, I like to call them, they felt like they lost the reins. They felt like they've got an out-of-control galloping horse. So they're doing crazy stuff. They're sticking their heels into America's ribs. They're uh, flacking us with a strap. Uh, they're doing much terribler things. They consider this horse old. They consider it to have distemper and poor training. And instead of being a beautiful Arabian or a Palomino or a thoroughbred, it's like my dad's old quarter horse lady. It's, uh, quick out of the gates, gets gassed at a quarter mile, um, but it doesn't like it. doesn't like riding Western. It likes riding English style. America wants to be a country that rides English style. America wants to leave its Western style riding and its quarter horses and its uh, painted mares and its various and sundry cliche Western type Palominos and and uh, Budweiser, War Horses, Clydesdales, leave all the workers behind, and we need to upgrade the entire country to English style, to dressage, to to steeplechase, to um, more of a continental way of doing things. And so there's a strong attempt. Okay, let me let me retreat, rewind. I believe that. And I think Adam Curry believes this, but I believe that the great thing that I have discovered is that when you make a word, you spell a word with letters. And spells are what I'm going to define everything down to. I mean, um, I'll talk about my concept of magic 
and what I believe magic to be and prayer to be and all that other stuff. But I believe that to be intention and I will scientize it, scientificize it. I'll humanize it with the whole concept of hearts and minds. Um, or as my mom and dad used to tell me when I was a kid, if you get them by the balls, their hearts and minds will follow. Or I think it's if you get them by the, if you grab them or if you get them by the balls, their hearts and minds do follow or shall follow. You tell me which is the proper quote. I love my parents. They were awful. They would have been better like roommates or they were terrible parents. They were awesome people, man. Like, uh, what's the word quixotic? Quixotic? I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, as a direct result of that, I believe, you know, what prayer works on is that you have bring, you know, three or more people together <coughs> who want something, right? And when you bring three or more people together who can agree on something, you start developing a consensus. And the more people who believe a certain thing the way it is, the harder it is to break into that consensus reality. Now, I would say that I'm a little bit of a romantic in terms of 19th century literature, but I believe that the reason why the early settlers, who are very superstitious and very religious, were afraid, like 19th, uh, um, early American, I would say 14, uh, 15th century, 16th century, 17th century um, America, uh, the time of uh, 1492 and, and well before 1776, there was a time when there were small settlements, right? And a lot of them were Puritans. A lot of them were early settlers. A lot of people were people who fled their native country because of religious persecution or general ethno cleansing. Uh, and uh, as a result, they huddled in these little settlements and they were desperate. All their literature was uh, about the wilderness and the wilderness in early American literature is the scariest thing in the entire world. Going out into the wilderness, you don't understand now. Being a settler means that you are willing to walk into uh, the unknown. I mean, not only that, but in terms of romantic Rousseauian type of idea of the wilderness, the wilderness is also the other. And the reason why the other, the wilderness is so magical is because it's unfettered by consensus reality. Now, if I get a little hippy dippy, it seems that the whole concept of consensus reality is actually energetically intentional. It's not just hearts and minds. Lots of people believe it. They were taught it in school, so therefore they enacted it in their life. It is more to do with just the act of believing something and expecting it to go in a certain way. So that expectation, when harnessed with other people's compatible expectations, kind of writes into the world an expectation fulfilling prophecy, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, what's going on now is there a, a strong-willed attempt, attempt one might say a cultural revolution as opposed to what America's always involved itself in, which is a cultural evolution, right? Like uh, the Civil War, I would say, was a cultural revolution. I would say that civil rights was a cultural revolution. I wouldn't say gay friendly was a cultural revolution. I would say it was a cultural evolution of marriage. Um, but like there's definitely other c cultural revolutions that were more uh, extremely heavy handed, such as the Chinese cultural revolution, um, a people's revolution, an attempt to um, like, for example, Pol Pot, who tried to kill off all the people with glasses because he didn't want the uh, extra strong battery of intention of intellectualism. He didn't want smart people. And the quickest way to get rid of smart people was to kill everybody with the glasses, right? So, ergo, these types of pruning, I would say, these types of, of uh, I don't know. I'll uh, come back in a second. I'm going to get my coffee. We'll have... Uh, this will be um, seamlessly connected to the next bit, but this is the end of my first rant. I'll talk to you soon. All right, I'm back. This is Chris Abraham's show, season six, episode two. Um, 
consensus reality. So I'll admit it. I'm a hippy dippy guy with this. I find that whenever I go into the wilderness, I am less fettered uh, by the consensus of a modern Western civilization. And uh, magic is more accessible, more visible. When people go into real rural areas, they enter into a world that is very much almost extremely customized to their intent, their will, their desire, and what their expectations are. I mean, I can totally see that in that uh, TV show called Alone, right? Where you have 10 people thrown into the wilderness in, uh, in uh, rural, uh, not rural, um, unspoiled places in Canada and Alaska and even, uh, even Australia, I think, and other places. And it's uh, amazing to see how, um, I mean, they call it, you know, the blindness of the madness. Of, they call it madness. They call it getting in your head and so forth. But in those environments, you have almost complete control of your manifestation destiny. You know, you have the ability to have, um, what are they called? Invasive thoughts. Um, you have the idea to second guess you. You have the opportunity to become nostalgic or paranoid or afraid or and one of those seeds, because there's nobody else in the consensus to check and balance you in the most heavy handed way of someone who loves you or lives with you coming to you and giving you a hug and breaking you from uh, an infinite loop to um, just general the checks and balance against antisocial behavior. Right. There's laws, there's law enforcement, there's even people who are civilians tend to. At least, especially in Berlin, in Germany, you walk against the light, uh, a million parents will yell at you and say, you are not manifesting the norms and values of our culture. Das ist nicht gut. Das ist nicht gut. Das ist nicht gut. Anyway, so I believe, uh, do you believe in magic? Yes, I do. I saw it. So back to magic. I saw it for the I've saw it many times. My mom was a witchy woman and talked about seeing angels and meeting angels and hearing um, heavenly harps. And uh, I'm chewing. I'm chewing. Sorry. Luckily, I run a, um, a filter that removes all the dead spaces. So you might not even hear me chewing or taking pauses. Because honestly, um, when I remove pauses because I speak so slowly... It literally brings the episode down by a fifth. So I have this neuro neurodivergence called, um, I have two, but I think that they're binary stars, if you will. One of them is called aphantasia, and that is the fact that I do not have a mind's eye. I have zero. You tell me, picture an apple, and I cannot see anything but black, if you will, quote-unquote black. Can you picture during guided meditation or yoga... Picture a, a candle. Picture a flickering light. Nope, sorry. I always tried. I always tried so hard. And the and people who have that, I call myself an aphant, but other people call themselves aphantastic, which I will not subscribe to or support it anyway. And then there's this thing called SDAM, SDAM. <coughs> and I forget what it means, and this will explain itself. I do not have... Uh, narrative, historical access to uh, detailed memory. Like I mentioned this in much earlier podcast, but you know, um, I assume that I smooched with Michelle or Betsy or uh, Wendy or Stephanie or Liz or whomever. Um, Michelle, I assume I smooched them more than once. But, like, I remember one or two really cool smooches. But, like, I don't remember daily bread at all. I don't remember daily smooch. I don't remember a continuous love life. I don't remember a kind of... I don't remember things like, you know, I don't know, uh, things like daily affection or um, daily touch or taking showers or baths together like like i really want to remember those things and you think those would be the highest thing and my number is pretty high like for someone who never dates 
never goes out and spends all of his time alone. Up until my 40s, I felt it was like my job not to have a bad body count. So I went against my nature and really hoe-bagged about a little bit, especially in college and in my 20s and 30s. Um, so, I mean, I remember I used to be able to remember, I used to write little lists of trying to remember who everybody was, but now I've just got boiled down to the top 10. And so it might sound like I've only had five girlfriends or six girlfriends in my entire life, but those are people I call my ex-wives. And they are like the disciples or the saints, right? Where I, of course, am the Christ figure. I'm the Christ bearer of Christopher, which means bearer of Christ. So they're my, my, my beautiful... They, they are the, the rarefied air of my limited existence and sad life. And I love every one of them. Karen Chalupski, Karen Van Eerden. I mean, I have to look through my blog. I mean, it's been around forever. Maybe I have some notes. Um, Liz Humphreys. Um, I think I only kissed Catherine once. Like, that was it. So that was one of my love of my life. And I also adored a woman named Liz uh, Johnston. But it was never that kind of thing. Like, it was more, it was more um, a soulmate, platonic crush. It was a crush. It was a crush. We had every, every chemistry except sexual. So, back to manifestation. I have a super hard time maintaining... Oh, okay. Experience with magic. Because I have the safe Fantasia, I do not hallucinate. I did hallucinate the two times, three times, four times, five times. I don't know. The dozen times I've taken um, psychedelics. Um, and they were amazing because, like, I can't... Imagine if you never had your ability to daydream or to um have an internal uh an internal um visualization or be able to close your eyes and see flashcards or see definitions or close your eyes and see your mom your dad your children um i cannot access any pictures of any of all y'all even if you were related to me even if i uh did the dirty with you even if we lived together and wore matching Atlas Tiffany rings, like, I need to look at a picture to remember you. I index you based on, you know, five feet tall, 100 pounds, maybe. Uh, I remember saying that she had uh, an apple bottom and anti-gravity breasts, like awful things like that that I index into my head about people. Um, but, you know, uh, the favorite foods, the places we went, the the church we went to, the fact that she went to St. Mark's and all those other things are just indexed like they're ASCII in a uh, a SQL PostgreSQL database, right? So, or Oracle. In this case, since we're being spiritual, it is hidden in the Oracle. And I, like the Oracle database, have lots and lots of stuff indexed. I know a little bit about everything. Um, maybe because of the compression my T, my GZ, TGZ, uh, tar, uh, gun zipped mind has greater efficiency to keep all of this, um, uh, holographic information when all y'all are carrying around JPEGs, PNGs, and, uh, PSDs, and etc. I don't even have to worry about WebPs. So just text in my, my clinkly little head. So, um, while I was talking to you, I ate the most delicious chocolate croissant. I hate to tell you that Starbucks, when they warm it for you, makes a mad chocolate croissant. In general, I'm disappointed by les croissants chocolat because there's never enough warm chocolate in there. It's usually an empty catacomb with like what looks like you know if you, you know if you just wipe your bottom badly with some scratchy tp it just seems like that's as much chocolate as is in the general croissant this afternoon i'm going to go to Ididos and i'm going to try their their croissant chocolat um is it pan chocolat or is it croissant choco chocolat anyway and see if they have that too because if i'm going to spend money i'd rather spend it at uh, Ididos. So back to magic. The reason why I have so much faith 
in things I don't see, don't know, and can't touch. I should be the biggest, I should be the biggest humanist in the entire world. I should totally be an atheist, but I am constantly being uh, barraged by what I call God winks. And I call them coincidences, and then I say there are no coincidences, and then uh, the perfect thing is said in a podcast, and one might say that's a coincidence, and then a reading. I, I subscribe to every single daily office that's on my on the podcast first. So like all the time when I'm listening to, I think 40,000 different podcasts I'm subscribed to on Podcast Addict. The only reason I bought 125 gigabyte, 128 gigabyte um, uh, Galaxy t- uh, was because I needed all that space for the constant downloading of, uh, of podcast content which I just listen to based on what the latest ones are. So I don't go into the depths. I just listen what's now, 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 now. And invariably, I listen to a lot of daily offices to the point where I believe that uh, uh, God is being a little heavy-handed with them. But it's made me believe that the Bible is a beautifully written document. Good Lord, thank you. The poetry, the imagism, the 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 symbolism the uh psychology the glamour the violence the humanity the bald-faced human that both god and man is since man was made in the in the in the vision or in the in the god man was made in the likeness of god ergo our god maybe not jesus but our god is as jealous and hostile and violent and cruel and paranoid and schizo and neurotic. I mean, he is a Jewish God as, as any Greek God. I mean, my pledge name that was given to me at Phi Kappa Psi DC Alpha and at GW was Zeus. I got to be called Zeus, which to me, because I believe that Zeus is just another avatar of God, I like to pronounce Zeus. Because Zeus and Deus are actually close homonyms. And I believe, you know, it's like Lucifer and Christopher. You know, it's the whole, there's the bear of, whether it's Christ or, or the, um, the bear of light. And I've had every opportunity to have a religious hallucination. There was this girl named Beth I was so in love with. <coughs> but she was so hot and curvy and voluptuous and amazing that I said to myself, Listen, guard dog, go ahead and chase that Ferrari. But if you caught her, you wouldn't know what to do with her. And that's how I felt. Beth was so fine. And I'm sure because we did smooch once, I think. Can't remember the S dam. Um, Anyway, we were hanging out a lot. We were besties at St. James Church. And it was, I call it Holy Hell Week. Uh, Was she on the vestry? I was on the vestry as Webright. And that's the board of directors of an Episcopal church. And Holy Hell Week is my favorite week of the year. Other people call it Holy Week. And Maundy Thursday is my favorite day. I did not honor it today. I feel like I peaked in high school. But um, the time that she and I saw it, um, we were sitting there in the church looking up at the host. And I forgot like what they call the host. It's in this amazing... Uh, kind of what feels like an Eastern Orthodox type of frame. And it's up on a, um, up on a, is it on the, I don't remember where it was up on, but it's a thing. Look it up. Like there's a sanct, sanct, uh, 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 sanctified, consecrated Catholic style wafer, which is supposed to be, and is in my faith, the body of Jesus, right? It's through transubstantiation through the changing during the blessing of bread to flesh, flesh of the Christ. And the job on Maundy Thursday is to, is to honor, actually, let me change that. It is to sit up awake with Jesus in the garden, in the story, the night before Good Friday, which is when Jesus is, is, tortured to death and uh gave him gave himself sacrificed himself for our sins i sound like uh i sound like so he didn't just they didn't just torture him to death 
he walked willingly to sacrifice. But the night before, he knew what, um, what his father was asking of him. So he was like, he couldn't sleep. He knew that he would be whipped and he would be beaten and he would be stabbed and he'd be crucified and he would have a crown of thorns pressed down onto his head. And it was going to suck. And he was trying to, it was like he was getting ready for a go ruck. Like yearly, they've got this go ruck. I think it's like, I think it's called special forces test. So it was sort of like going, it was sort of like, <clears throat> uh, it was like a seal. The night before a seal goes to uh, his his selection or a ranger goes to his selection or an airborne goes to his selection or a special forces goes to his selection. Or in this case, let's say Mossad, right? Mossad. Let's say this is selection for whatever Israel's SAS is. And he knows that it's going to be rough the next day and that recruits die. And he knows for a fact that he's going to sacrifice his life for us. So he's not having good sleep. And you know what? All of his disciples are like, we're totally safe. We're totally good. We're in this garden of Gethsemane. If I said that right, I'm like using my database. I don't have anything in front of me ever. Garden of Gethsemane? And they're like, no worries, mate. They're like a bunch of Australian backpackers. No worries, no worries. It's all good, no worries, all good. And um, he's like... Um, stay up. Come on, guys, stay up. And so, Maundy Thursday, you volunteer to sit with this consecrated wafer the entire night until the morning when, um, you know, when the guards come in and, and, uh, and away with him. Um, and, uh, so man, it, it, everybody knows that if you stay up all night with Jesus's wafer in a church, you are going to trip balls. And Beth tripped balls. She saw all the things. She saw all the things. And I tried to do the eye thing. I tried to do the do not focus on anything. I tried all of the meditation, yogic attempts at, that I use. Okay, the only magic I do have is if I stare you in the eyes, I can look down into your soul. All right. So I don't abuse that. I kind of abuse that in my 20s. Don't abuse that at all anymore. So that's my only magic. I can look all the way down to your toes if you give me a good, honest, like, trusting look in my eyes. I can literally just, like, I can get all to your, all the way to your toes. But I think everybody does that. That's why they say the eyes are the window or the doorway to your soul. So I consider that to be something that I think is cool, but I believe everybody can do it. That's why people have such a hard time um, making eye contact. And that's why people who have uh, uh, neuro non-divergent brains, especially autistic people, have a hard time looking at people into the eyes, not because they're shy or shifty or whatever. I bet you they get a lot, uh, like, I bet you they get, like, like if you talk about, what is it called? Um, um, uh, what is the term? Uh, uh, I forget. Uh, um, um, there's an amazing book that I love and haven't read in a while, and it says that we have a reducing valve in our understanding of the world. And if I keep on talking about the reducing valve, maybe it'll come to me. Um, I believe that Doors of Perception, Aldous Huxley. See, that was a tough, man. I think when, when, it, when I have to work my way to remembering something, I tell my buddy Mark, I'm like, I need to restore from tape drive. And since none of you know anything about tape drive or anything like that, I can say I want to restore from thumb drive. I want to restore from a uh, SIM card. I want to restore from, uh, I don't know. But I say I'm restoring from tape drive because that was always a real pain in the ass. And, you know, um, tape drives and tapes don't always keep forever and you misplace them or you forget to do a backup or the backup is corrupted. So Aldous Huxley, Doors of Perception, he's on and on and on about. And the way I, I loved it, I love the fact that I believe that I have a loosened reducing valve, but it's obviously not visual. It's not visual at all. And it's not memory based at all. Mark, who knows me better than anybody and might be, might be the devil. I don't know. Um, 
if he is the devil, he's not bad. So I, I'd get to know him. Sweet, lovely man. Loves his wife more every day. Would have been an amazing father. Um, but, you know, human too. And he said, uh, oh yeah, so in order for me to see, I need to really look. And so I stare at people all the time. And Mark's like, you should never put down that camera because a camera allows you to hide behind the sea. And you need to look. You need to look hard. You need to look for as long as you need to look and then look longer because you can't capture it. The idea of take a picture and it'll last longer is impossible for me unless I take a picture. And I historically never look at the pictures I take. So there's that. <clears throat> so uh, she was tripping balls. She was seeing all the God. I believe she had a real true spiritual experience, which is why when I meet people who say that they're the second coming of Jesus, even if they're a homeless guy who's hanging out at Roy Rogers near GW back in the late 80s, or if he's a homeless guy at Miriam's Kitchen, or if he's from another faith, or when my friend Janet Taylor told me that she has two-way conversations with God in her Mormon world. I don't know if that's everybody in Mormonism, but I believe that some people say that they that they pray and talk to God and then they look for signs. She, and I believe her, and I envy her, has, has ham radio. It's not shortwave, baby. It's ham radio. It's breaker, breaker, breaker. You got ears on, Jesus, and I envy that. So any, my mom told me that when she was young, she fell off a dock, I think, and hit her head and fell into a lake. And when she was down there, she heard harps and was brought to the surface by a hand. My dad has seen ghosts. My mom, uh, who is barking mad and, and definitely the kind of, like, pagan Catholic. You know, I believe that Catholics are pagan witches, and I believe that Masons are pagan wizards. And uh, let me tell you why. But in a second, my mom, her mom, you know, read tea leaves, and she, whenever she got lost, she told me a story about how she got let out of a bus, and it was it was um, foggy, and a nice male, kind stranger with nice eyes said, "Miss, can I help you?" And walked her to a to a an open diner, and then disappeared. Poof! Like my mom tells me, even though she's a mad woman, and my dad and everybody else tells me. She was a mad woman in the attic. She was a witchy woman. And uh, and if she were in America in 1495, they would have burned her as a witch. That's for sure. 1500, surely my mom would have been burned by a, as a witch. And I probably would have lit the frickin' pyre. Sorry, Mom. I love you. <laughs> so, uh, como di, como di, como di. Yeah, so, so she saw... Something. She definitely told me that the consecrated wafer rose into the rafters, rose up. It it ascended. It was brought to heaven. Um, she was tripping balls, but she was tripping balls by no tripping. She opened herself up to the Holy Spirit. She, in a safe environment, she felt comfortable to uncoil <coughs> her kundalini. She felt it comfortable to open the doors of perception. She felt safe to to reduce the the cinch of the reducing valve, and she was able to see past this mortal coil into the other. She was able maybe to have a glimpse of the 11 dimensions that we, uh, or that theoretical physicists say that we enjoy every day unbeknownst to us. So I believe in consensus reality. I believe that when we talk about when we start to do this whole, like, noble savage crap, or we, like, completely idolize, we completely idolize, like, the village elders and, like, the holy man and the, and the, and the, and the medicine man and all these other things, it is existent in 1950s America. You go to any town in America and there's a freaking holy man in your village. There might be five holy man, men in your village. Today, there's a hundred holy men in my village. There's um, my Episcopal priest, mother, Father Downing, God rest his soul. There's rabbis, there's mullahs, there's, 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 there's all the other things. There's, there's, uh, I don't know, 
there's my um, my I mean masonry isn't a isn't a religious organization but I have great respect for the past master uh, past masters of my lodges um, there's no end in the uh, the the people who are given the calm the safety the resources the money the home the and the protection to unwind their kundalini, uh, open up their third eye, uh, take off their uh, kippa, their kip kippa kippa, their uh, and allow their paint to receive uh, the the Holy Spirit or uh, the other or goddess or prana or or whatever. I mean even. Even a Masonic Lodge has a clear portico. Is that right? It has a, a, um, uh, uh, um, uh, everyone should have a glass hole above the altar that allows the, you know, allows the cosmic magic to come through and for the prayers to get out. I mean, it's pretty cool, right? Um, I love Freemasonry. Um, I love thinking of a divine watchmaker. I love thinking of architect of the universe. Um, so, even though I don't have personal experience, I love and trust and am not cynical. And uh, I try not to be envious, but I take, I'm a voyeur, right? I'm a, I'm a full-on voyeur, as I revealed the last show. And even though that oftentimes manifests in looking at cute butts, maybe... It also manifests in really seeing people and really talking to them and asking them who they are on the inside and then luring them through the exposure of my eccentric understanding of the world, luring them into sharing their own eccentricities and their own beliefs. For example, I love the fact that my beautiful and amazing Michelle, call her Buzz from now on, Buzz Nolan, she came to the house completely open about the fact that she had a tarot and her tarot, like like a lithium ion battery, would run out. I don't know where she saw the bars, the number of bars on her tarot, her eye tarot, but every full moon she would set her 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 prize tarot deck up uh we had we had a basement apartment, but it had it had um uh what is it called? Sky? Skylights? Sky windows? And, uh, <coughs> what is it called in a car? It's called moonroof. We had lots of moonroofs in our, in our apartment. And so if she could see the, uh, the full moon out of a particular portico, she would, maybe she had a, maybe she had a, um, maybe she did something. Maybe there were words, uh, that she spoke, but she would, I would wake up in the morning and I would find her tarot. Um, somewhere strategically pla placed so that she could get it recharged. Don't think people are professing their love of God, professing their love of Christ, pro professing their love of Krishna or of Buddha or of, uh, and I understand Buddha is a man, he is an avatar, he is an ascended master, and he's a Christ and not to be worshipped. But that's totally what a Christ would say. People who worship the saints, people who worship Jesus, who worship um, uh, Allah, peace be upon him, who worship uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, who worship uh, whomever, Sai Baba, people who worship Sai Baba or Ganesh, or or their, uh, in Hawaii, everybody was re was worshiping their ancestors. And in East India and in South, uh, sorry, in East Asia and South Asia, uh, in so many parts of the world, people have altars to their, <coughs> to their ancestors, recent and far. People have Sai Baba. People have gurus. Um, if I ever really settle into a house, I will take the, I will find a photo of Father Downing and I will put him up uh, in lieu of, um, of, uh, and I might even put up John Paul II. I love that guy. Um, and uh, who knows? I mean, it makes you remember. I believe that people who are unfettered to consensus reality have more access to creativity. They have more access to themselves and so forth. And I believe that whether or not people are telling you what to believe about, like the vaccine or about Ukraine or about Biden or about Trump or about um, Zelensky 
or about um, whomever, about Z, Z's Shum, Z or, or, or Park or whomever, right? Like, uh, whatever people tell you, I mean, first of all, they might not believe that. Like I said, it takes a... So there's a woman uh, that I'm friends with here who has, uh, as a name, since she's in my life now, I don't want to out her, but we hang out at the cafe, cafe as much as serendipity allows. And to the world, she is extremely traditional, probably um, Lutheran or some type of like non-denominational Christian or goes to church, goes to masses, goes to outside worships, all this other stuff to the world. Ugh. Within half an hour of talking to her, she let me know that her spirituality is like all the way to theosophy, all the way to spiritualism, all the way to ascended masters, all the way to belief in the in the Christ head, in the Godhead of of prayers as spells, as prayers as meaning merely being a Christian redefinition of spells. That spells are either fueled by a big battery of a person who has a lot of spiritual vigor or a lot of dim bulbs. If you get enough dim bulbs to um, focus on your consensus reality, you can do amazing things. Like, for example, George Norrie, who is, you, people call him George Snorri from, there's a crazy guy yelling behind me. So hopefully Adobe AI sound cleaner will fix it. But um, George Nori used to periodically have, uh, used to periodically have, uh, like he has millions upon millions of people who watch his radio show from, uh, 1 a.m. DC Eastern to 4 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific to 11, 12, 1, 2 o'clock Pacific. So as a result, um, he would periodically get everybody... So I mentioned that guy who just walked by. I mentioned him the other day and said that I was afraid that he was going to turn his anger to me. But he is having a different experience. He's talking to someone who's quite in a different world. He's either having his visualization uh, experiences or he's going through trauma or he's having what are called flashbacks or PTSD, etc. But he's not always like that. He's lucid a lot of the time. And I saw him at uh, Starbucks the other day. And he was just sitting there being sweet and lovely. And I carry a $20 bill. Oh, I need to get Powerball today. Thanks for reminding me. I carry a $20 bill in one of the pockets of my chest kit bag. And I keep it because I believe that uh, Madame Pele, who is a goddess of fire to the Hawaiian people, and who takes care of her, like the modesty and the pride and the hubris and the safety and the kindness checks of her people by periodically showing up as a human homeless or a human uh, woman, homeless or on the side of the road or needing a ride or old human woman. And the test is whether you take a stop and whether you help her, whether you love on her, whether you give her the respect of her age, of her existing, of her being there and of her being receptive and in the, as part of your path. When they say, this is your path, you must believe that people come into your path for many reasons. And if someone knows the quote that St. James's had, and I need to ask all my St. James's friends, in the missive, uh, there's this, there was this thing at the end, you know, when you leave, you have your uh, handout and it says, uh, be, you know, uh, be blessed and leave here to experience the day and find the face of God in every face around you. And I need to find the proper quote. But I saw him in Starbucks, and they don't abide by panhandling there. So he kind of whispered at me, and he's like, can you, help a, can you help a guy out? And I put my forefinger to my lips, and I'm like, 
I kind of, you know, shrugged my shoulder and I said, and he put his finger up and he see, he made a silly face and went, and I unzipped my, my chest kit and I took out the folded 20 that I keep in there for Madame Pele and I handed it to him and he put his finger up, he opened his hand, took the money, put his finger up to his lips and went, and I went, and I backed away and I smiled and he smiled at me and we had our little secret. And I joked about this on Mastodon by saying that was my inoculation against him ever losing his shit and like getting into a fight with me, like fisticuffs or or like aggressive attack or while I'm recording one of these things coming up behind me and hitting me with something because he was triggered by kind of my quasi militaristic air or the fact that I'm like a 50 something year old white man. Um, or that, you know, whatever, that I'm loud, that I'm tall, that I'm big, whatever reason, like I am not part of his narrative, but I could, you know, become part of that. For example, there was a girl I dated in, in, in England and, uh, we were smitten. We took a trip to Germany together. We were hugging and kissing. We were holding hands. We were, uh, and the moment it came to smooching, she freaked out. And I found out later that she had Like, when she was very young and very small, she had a terrible, like, assault experience, an abuse uh, experience with with a much larger person. I assume she was a child and he was an adult. And the fact that I'm six foot three and at that point I was 220 pounds uh, freaked her the hell out. And she had, she couldn't do it. She couldn't do it. Like, any, anything close to, like, getting rolled up in a in a in a in a in a huddle cuddle snuggle as the as the Aussies say or even like some some petting some loving she would just freak the hell out it wasn't a it wasn't a like we're only friends bro it was like you trigger some stuff in me man and I can't like I'm having like full-on panic attack now so Like, I understand that my reality and other people's reality are not always the same. And I need to, to quote the best advice I ever got. And I think this is from Mark too, damn it. He said, always, he knows how kind I am to other people. Whether it's, I try. Like, I also lash out and I'm crazy and mean-spirited and I can be vicious. And I can hold things against you. And I can be probably paranoid and neurotic. But when I'm at my best... I am generous, I am kind, I am loving, I am understanding, I try to be. It's like my aspiration in life. I'm not nice to idiots on social media, but that's neither here nor there. I think you're a brainwashed sheep. (coughs) Mind you, I think there's brainwashed sheep on both sides. Um, But he's like, Chris, treat yourself with as much patience and kindness and generosity and understanding and love and acceptance and 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 quietness and 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 listening as you would a child as you would any one of your friends as you do people at the bar as you do every day at the cafe and as you do to everyone treat yourself that way give yourself a little bit of that slack baby you are so kind and i know it's not out of i'm putting words in his mouth now it's like i know it's not like me where i'm being condescendingly nice to people you actually really care about them you are sympathetic and empathetic but i know that's not true so that is the shtick that is the cliche caricature that i've always had uh for mark and tried to teach his friends about and they all don't believe it so um but you know it sucks being the it sucks being the asshole it it sucks being the monster or the villain in your own freaking story anyway so yeah uh he wasn't my madame pele but i i don't think I don't think I did it as preemptive, um, what is it, a buy-off or like a pandering or a, what is it called, a bribe? I didn't bribe uh, this man who lives on the rough, in the rough. I didn't bribe him to prevent me from future attacks um, and an opportunity for a lethal response. I did not do it for that reason. I did it because I knew he was lucid. I knew that he saw me. I knew that I was real to him. I knew he had kind eyes, and I knew it was the time to engage with him in a generous, loving, selfless act. Because if I try... Oh, something I learned in scuba diving training. You might love this if you're all the way through. 
something I learned in scuba diving training. I was a dive master. Wasn't a dive instructor, but I was a dive master. And they teach you that lots of people have extreme issues when it comes to um, issues of, you know, being underwater, wearing a mask, uh, not being able to access the uh, the air, uh, the restrictions of breathing and an apparatus, second stage, first stage, the idea of your time ticking down, uh, the idea of being in a in a solution you don't know, being uh, it, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, or 125 feet underwater. Uh, ideas such as underwater animals, uh, strange environment, where the hell's my buddy, where's the boat, like any number of things. It usually shows up early, but it can happen at any time. And as a dive master, one of my jobs was to be a shepherd. Everybody had their dive buddy, but I was the general shepherd. And one of the things they teach you at Patty, once you enter the world of needing to take care of others, because they don't want to freak you out. Like when you're a dive master, you learn about uh, pressure injuries and, and lung injuries and shallow water blackouts and nitrogen narcosis. And you learn about uh, expansion injuries and the bends and all that other fun stuff. It's great training. But one of the things you learn is that um, never approach a panicked person to their face. If you see someone with um, with uh, saucer uh, sized eyes and it looks like they're going to bolt to the surface, which is always a bad idea because that one atmosphere, which is around 30 meters, one atmosphere is enough to go ahead and create, uh, turn your, 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 uh, your red wine into sparkling wine. <laughs> and we all know that's not good. So when you start to see the signs of people freaking out, you don't even let them know that you're approaching. You go behind them and you you access them from their uh, from their um, from their tank because when they start to panic, they start to tear at you, they start to claw at you, and you might have your second stage pulled out of your mouth. You might uh, the person might go ahead and and um, and mess with your uh, valve. Uh, your air valve, they might pull your, uh, you'll, they'll definitely, generally speaking, pull your mask from your face, and both of you will get fucked up and need saving. So this is a rule that I, I fail at every time. All of my other friends are really good at that, but, um, and I'm good at that with everybody but my significant other. <clears throat> I'm so desperately afraid of being left or being betrayed or being hurt or being taken advantage of, or being lied to, or being cheated on, or being um, disrespected, to be honest, that when stuff starts to escalate, I'm always um, an echo box. I'm always a an amplifier. I'm always a preamp amplifier feedback loop. So, shit, man, I need therapy. Anyway, um, consensus reality. I believe that we will ourselves into a world if we stay independent we might or might not have a lot of effect on the world, but the world doesn't need uh, mob rule. The world needs to be left alone. Um, mob rule, mob intention, mob prayer uh, is, um, I mean, in the Catholic Church, they teach us that prayer is innately good. But as I said, prayer is basically just just spell casting. Prayer is just spell casting. It's like Harry Potter reading from runes. Oh, here's one. Uh, the first time I ever realized that my father Downing at St. James's Church was a wizard, in addition to being like like a real priest, like like a um, Merlin type of priest. <laughs> Finally, like I have all of his, I have all of his trust and love and so forth, and I'm on the vestry and I'm helping out during Holy Hell Week, and I'm like stage manager, not stage manager. I'm like stage guy. Like I'm not like there were times when I'm out there and helping the service, but there's other times when I'm just in the back of facilitating things. And this was a time, remember, like from, from, uh, from fairy tales or whatever, uh, bubble, bubble, toiling in trouble. Like, remember when riches, witches have, um, a, uh, an urn, is it an urn? It's, um, I need to know the word, uh, uh, um, 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 it'll come to me, but I'm going to ask, I'll be right back. 
Cauldron. Cauldron. I didn't even look it up. I remembered it. Cauldron. And so you put the Eye of Noon, you put this and you put that and put that. And like you read over it uh, a spell and then it turns into a love poem or it turns into poison. You put the apple in or whatever, right? So so I'm there backstage. And like, like I, as I said, like um, masonry and church and temple and uh, even like Olstein and mega churches and uh, cults and all these things. I know that you guys might feel that they're all theatrical and they are like theatrical entertainment like Broadway just used to separate the patrons and the congregants from their money. But all these mofos freaking believe what they believe. Like I was back there with Father Downing and we were alone and I had no expectation and I didn't know what was going on. And he stood there and he prayed over a font of water. He prayed over a font of water and it, it just flashed to me. I'm like, I said in my head, I said, uh, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. I saw my priest doing a spell casting onto a cauldron of water, turning it through the power of magic. In this case, the power of the Holy Spirit transubstantiating it into holy water and i've seen him do it you see him up there uh, at the altar he does it uh, all churches do it right in front of everybody they transubstantiate i know you think that's the the theatrical but the way father downing described it to us he said when the mass happens we exist concurrently in the body of christ in the words of christ in the time of Christ. So not only do the prayers in a mass or in a church bring us back to Christ's time, but also we eat of his body and drink of his blood and we receive the blessing of, of holy water, which is spell cast potion. And we also uh, time travel into, I'm going to make it up, right? But like, let's say 2000 years ago, and to the time when Jesus broke bread with his disciples in the restaurant or wherever he was, the Last Supper, or all the millions of times he broke bread with his followers, his disciples, his believers, the people who loved him, uh, the prostitutes, the homeless, those people with um, the sick, the unclean, um, uh, whose father, fa um, uh, uh, the the people with leprosy, like like when we go to church and we receive the body and blood of Christ in the form of that consecrated wafer and the transubstantiated uh, red wine, and we take it, whether it's in the form of a husk of bread or um, in a wafer or a bite of a, of a loaf or a bite of a baguette, and you drink whatever, uh, um, grape juice, if it's, uh, you know, or if you drink a real uh, church wine, after it's been blessed, you were there. Christ is feeding you. Christ is giving you uh, drink. Christ is giving you food. Christ is giving himself to you. And literally, according to that, um, he is there with you presently in our time, through time travel of the Mass. We are with him in his day, a living church, one God forever and ever. So if you go to church, you get to see water turn to holy water. That's offstage in the culture, which I saw Wizard Dick Downing doing spells, spell casting on a cauldron to make holy water. And I believe it. Holy Spirit was there. It's magic. Or uh, in the pews or up on the altar with him, next to him, watching him break the, consecrate the bread, transubstantiate the bread, bless the bread, turn it into food. It is food. Turn it into the, the body, the flesh of the Christ, and then turning the wine into his blood that he sacrificed for us. So prayer is not innately good or bad. You could make everybody hate Russia, or you could make everybody pray for Ukraine, um, uh, um, hate Russia. You can make everybody hate uh, the internal combustion engine or love solar. You can make people, and all of these intentions, all of these intentions are prayers 
that feed into the consensus re reality energy and make the reality that we have to work within. One might say their morals and dogma, might say their morals and values, might say that they're cultural norms. There's so many ways you can call it. Um, and what's right now, what's happening now could be called a mutiny. It could be called a revolution. It could be called a world war. Three, it could be called a civil war. In my last couple episodes, I say that it's a hot civil war. And the hot civil war is being, is being fought by the new elite class of, of, um, of, uh, let's, let's, let's say, I don't know what it's called, but let's say <coughs> King Arthur and the Knights and the Footmen. But instead of King Arthur, the Knights and the Footmen, we have the Department of Justice. We have, uh, um, lawyers are the Knights, uh, AUSAs are the Knights, um, 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 federal judges, court judges, local judges, Supreme Courts. These are all the Abrams tanks and the Bradley fighting vehicles and the hypersonic rockets of America's Civil War, um, of America's World War III. Um, and this mutiny is, like I've said in every podcast I've had, it's being run by a vanguard of the proletariat. The 80% of America either is not paying attention or is just going to church, having kids, getting educations, believing in Western culture, believing in the rule of law, smiling at their local cop, finding any kind of crime to be abhorrent, uh, shooting people who try to hurt them or their property. Um, like, they're having a hard time. In the same way that Ukraine can never win against Russia, no matter how badly we want it, no matter how much money we spend on it, because Russia is not Soviet Union, and Putin is not Stalin, or Lenin, or Pol Pot, or even Hitler, or Chairman Mao. He is a... He is... He's even a lower level spook than George H.W. Bush was, who has the entire Langley named after him because he was director of the CIA, as if that's not he he invented neocon uh, or Preston did Preston Bush. Anyway, so this is just like Ukraine trying to take over Russia. Russia believes in Eastern Orthodox. It believes that men are men and women are women and Women shouldn't sit on cold concrete without a pad because it'll hurt their ov their 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 womb, and they're ba a little bit backward, and they're a little bit traditional, and they don't understand or approve of the LGBTQ plus uh, IA two spirit, and they don't get trans, and they consider probably since they really do believe in Jesus, and they believe in God and they believe in do do Orthodox people believe in the saints? I believe so. And they truly believe it's not theatrical, it's not LARPing, it's not playing, it's deeply seated belief. No matter how paranoid you want to get, thinking that all the priests and rabbis and uh and rectors and uh evangelist preachers and so forth around you are just when they go to when they go to seminary at Princeton or Virginia seminary um, they go into class, they lock the doors, and they're like, okay, we're all pretending to be Christian, right? Like, let's just go ahead and take that money. Uh, no matter how paranoid you want to believe to believe that uh, that uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, religious belief is all performative, I'm afraid you're not right. So, um, so what, what, what um, Putin or Russia or Hungary or Poland thinks is they believe that there are men and women and that men and women should have maybe the freedom to uh, to um, Comic-Con to dress up or act or affect any type of behavior, any type of gender, any type of character, any type of, of, of anything in their life um, with the understanding that people around them might not understand them and that to do anything official in terms of of uh, of judicial or or laws or crimes or anything is to indulge a delusion, right? Like um, 
my buddy uh, Mike Tuck met me for coffee last week, and he said that he was down in Crystal City, and there was an anime festival or a Comic Con or whatever. And he's like, people, like there were men in the men's room who had all of their makeup and their dresses and their costumes out, and they were getting ready for the 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 oh, what is it called when. Uh, what is it called? Hold on. All right. I can't believe I could remember cosplay. But I think I think um, uh, traditional countries uh, who do not consider, uh, to, do not, who hadn't grown up in Hawaii where there are uh, two spirit people and there are people who are um, um, trans, uh, as far as I can tell, we call them mahu. Uh, it's a beautiful, respected uh, second spirit, if you will. Um, we, they do not come from that culture. And so they just believe that um, everything that America is going on with regards to wokeness and with regards to trans and with regards to uh, non gender non-binary and with regards to pronouns and so forth, they believe that this is just cosplay. And that at the end of the day, you're going to get tired of dressing up like Pikachu and you're going to take uh, some, um, what is it called, uh, witch hazel on a puff and you are going to remove all the Pikachu paint, the yellow Pikachu paint from your face. And you're going to decide at some point that you're going to get married and have kids and have grandkids and continue the tradition of your life. There's, there's always been theatrical people. There's always been people on the stage. Everybody from time immemorial have gone to certain cities in certain enclaves and certain cultures in order to indulge they're theatrical, they're non-binary, they're, um, they're, um, I was born into the wrong body. I'm not the right person. I mean, listen, I do, I wake up every day and I do not like, I have that same kind of panic when, hold on, let me find the word. All right. Dysphoria. <coughs> I have all kinds of dysphoria, right? I'm 53 now and I'm, I have dysphoria over that, right? I'm forever 28, tw forever 30. 30, right? Everybody says that they want to be 30 again. I have dysphoria about the extra 100 pounds I have on my body. I'm, I'm obesity dysphoric. I am um, uh, performance dysphoric. My knees are bad, and I wish I could just run upstairs and downstairs and do uh, pistol squats and goblet squats and deep squats and that kind of stuff. So I am performance dys dysphoric. I'm also dysphoric in terms of where I thought my life was going to be, right? I probably thought uh, that I was going to marry Michelle or marry Wendy um, and that I would have kids by now and grandkids and then I would be wealthy and have a home and a travel budget and spend uh, four times a year at Renaissance Weekend and visit friends and write letters and write novels and write books, have leisure time and have a cool car like a tr6 or a porsche 911 and maybe a couple motorcycles and a and an opportunity to be in the ocean a lot and do a lot of uh rowing in a single or all those other things right um i'm dysphoric with regards to that i have uh body dysmorphia i feel like i was when i was a hot uh 20 year old or a hot 30 year old or even a hot 40 year old and I have dysphoria, I have dysmorphia, I have age dysmorphia, I have obesity dysmorphia, I have, uh, I'm dysmorphic about my health, I'm in denial about my health, and all that other kind of stuff, right? We all go through it. My mom went through it. My mom was the most beautiful girl in her school and, and really could not deal with the fact that she ended up becoming a crone. We all become crones, right? She did not get the same kind of attention. It went from the attention that a beautiful woman gets to the attention that an old lady gets. And she didn't like it. She didn't like it at all. She didn't like being cast aside. She felt so much bitterness and, 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 uh, and sadness as a result, right? So we all have dysphoria. We always want to be the... I mean, I'd love to hold on to that cool guy who beguiled everybody at Renaissance Weekend, who... Like people would come and see, and I was talking, you know, to like, like that guy, but that guy drove me crazy. I constant anxiety, constant, like close to panic attacks. I completely freaked out and yelled 
at my friend Jana when I came home to the hotel room that we were sharing and she had had the heat up and I was hot and I was willing myself to be in a, a cold hotel room so I could recover and take 10 minutes to myself. And I freaking yelled at her all the force of my anger and like this giant battery that I said, Mark says I have all this giant spiritual and like energetic vibrational energy that I can pour out to people with my big size and my big voice and my big eyes and my, and my facial gestures and my, 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 my postures and everything. She got a full dump of it. It was only over a freaking hot room that I expected to find it to be ice cold waiting for me, which is the way I've always left my hotel rooms in the past. And my expectation and what I went into seemed like a cruel trick by her. And it wasn't. I just went completely mental. So anyway, back to consensus reality. Like when they say, be careful what you spend your, your, yourself, spend your time thinking about, you do will things into the world. You don't have to speak it out loud. But I do believe that X, Mastodon, Facebook, Twitter, it's all a spellcasting system. Instagram, it's all spellcasting. All spellcasting. It's all magic. It's all manifesting. It's all creating runes. It's all entering. Every time you post something, it puts something into the world. And uh, and I'm not just saying it like in a, you know, every time you thought you were getting bad mom advice and it was just like these trite things. Um, David Foster Wallace said this, all the crappy generic information that your friends and family have ever given you have been way more profound than the greeting card bullshit, the uh, stitcheroo bullshit, the, 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 the leg tattoo bullshit that you think it is. It's profoundly deep profoundly deep and uh so you know psalms so much good stuff holy mackerel and uh so when they say be careful what you speak into the world be careful how you spend your mind thinking be careful to the garbage that you end up chewing you are what you eat but you are also it's even worse it's not only you are what you think or you are what you speak into the world or you are what you tweet you literally speak into the world and it becomes part of a consensus reality, not just because of your influence, but because of the combined spiritual affect and the spiritual inf effect and the spiritual infection and the um, secondary tertiary effect of it existing in the world. Forever and forever and ever. Amen. This is the Chris Abraham Show, Season 6, Episode 2. It is the new level of the forever cast. And I'm going to go put it together and post it for all y'all forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Chris Abraham show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes until next time.